dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to introduce Linus Dubs to the today's uh, resident lecture. Linus is a second year resident and he will take us into the world of the venous thromboembolism and its prophylaxis. Furthermore, I want to welcome Dr. Hegemann from the Department of Oncology as a specialist and she will part to this lecture and the discussion. Linus, enjoy. So thank you, Selim, for the kind introduction and thanks, uh, Dr. Hegemann, for coming today. Today I'm going to talk about the prevention of venous thromboembolism and its complications in surgery. In my talk, I want to repeat the forms and relevance of venous thromboembolism. I want to address the question, who needs prophylaxis and how to estimate the patient's risk. I will introduce the available methods to uh, prevent the venous thromboembolism. And I will also uh, mention the dilemma of thrombosis versus bleeding. The two most common forms of venous thromboembolism are deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Can one of the residents name me the typical symptoms of deep vein thrombosis? Yes, please. Um, so usually you have pain and you have swelling. Often it's in the leg and um, a feeling of heaviness and also uh, warmth. So correct. Uh, DVT mostly manifests as a swollen, painful, warm and heavy leg. And common complications are pulmonary embolism, post-thrombotic syndrome and rarely the maximal version of it with a uh, phlegmasia serolea dolens. About 90% of pulmonary embolism develops from a DVT. It manifests as chest pain, coughing or tachypnea. It can lead to acute life-threatening hemodynamic instability or chronically to a thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So why should you care as surgeons? Because VT is frequent. On a population base, it shows an incidence of one person per thousand per year. This leads to an economic burden in the US of $20 billion. Of note is that VT occurs in up to every third patient uh, undergoing surgery postoperatively if we do not perform adequate prophylaxis. And VT is potentially life-threatening. 8% of the surgical <laughs> patients experiencing a VT die from it. VT is the easiest avoidable post-operative complication with potential risk of death. To underline this, I want to show this study. It was shown that with a pharmacological prophylaxis, the risk of DVT in surgical oncological patients was already reduced from 35% to 13%. By adding a mechanical prophylaxis, the residual risk was only 5%. And we need to understand the disease to correctly prevent it. From med school, we remember that according to Virko's triad, thrombosis is a result of stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage. When we perform surgery, we trigger all of these factors. So does every patient need prophylaxis? It depends. And it depends on the risk of the disposition that our patient brings and the expositional risk that our procedure brings. Many factors we cannot change, such as the age, ethnicity, or gender, or personal or familiar history of our patient. But what we can do is to recognize them. So ask your patient if he or his family has experienced uh, thromboembolic events Check his diagnosis list for chronic diseases with the risk of thromboembolism and be alert in patients with malignant diseases. When it comes to the exposition, I want, you to hi I want to highlight that the risk depends on the type of surgery. For example, one of the highest risk is seen in orthopedic surgery where there is longer immobilization of the patient. Another important factor is the duration and the trauma caused by the surgery. So the difficulty, especially for younger residents, is the estimation of the risk. And therefore I want to introduce the Caprini score, which is a validated tool in abdominal surgery to estimate your patient's risk. Uh, 
To give you an estimate, I want to show you that an everyday patient like this 70-year-old patient with colon carcinoma undergoing laparoscopic hemicolectomy already scores six points by his age, the procedure and the underlying malignancy. With six points, he belongs to the risk category already and he brings a risk for venous thromboembolism of more than 6%. How can we prevent venous thromboembolism? We as physicians, we tend to focus on pharmacological methods only, which is right, but not the full truth. A simple but effective method is early mobilization. Studies have shown that the early mobilization can reduce the risk of VT after knee replacement by up to 70%. Not even mentioned at this point beneficial effects on other complications such as postoperative pneumonia. So I want you to motivate your patients to move at least three times a day and always think to involve the physiotherapists. Third, mechanical methods. Mechanical methods involve gradient compression stockings and intermittent compression <laughs> devices. Generally, there is way more evidence for intermittent compression devices, but a common problem is compliance. Attention should also be paid in patients with decompensated heart failure, leg ischemia, or skin lesions. And mechanical prophylaxis should rather be seen as a supplementation than a replacement of pharmacological uh, prophylaxis. An example of additional methods is an inferior vena cava filter. IVC filters are reserved for rare situations in which we have contraindications for conventional methods or when we see recurrent thromboembolism despite them. This is due to the fact that they bring a risk for major complications such as dislocation, perforation with bleeding and filter embolization with a potential risk of death. Now I want to focus on the pharmacological methods. You're probably familiar with this graph. It shows the common path of the coagulation cascade. The coagulation cascade, it offers many targets for anticoagulative therapy. Over the past decades, anticoagulant therapy has developed from an easy play to a situation where we're spoiled for choice. And for a non-hematologist, it became complex to overview the amount of drugs and stay up to date. Here's a list of modern anticoagulant therapy. Unfortunately, time-wise, I will not be able to go through every of them. Therefore, I want you to at least know your daily business. This typically involves heparins. Heparinoids, pentasaccharides, and anti-2A inhibitors mostly find their use in patients with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Vitamin K antagonists are rather unhandy for pre-interventional thromboprophylaxis due to their long half-life, the delayed onset of effect, and the interaction with other drugs. Interest is growing in the last group in the novel oral anticoagulants, NOAX. They can be applied orally with a shorter half-life and less interactions than vitamin K antagonists. NOx are pricey though, and antagonization was not possible for a long time. So far, NOx only find their uh, mission for prophylaxis in uh, knee and hip replacement surgery. The use of NOx will probably grow. It already became challenging since many of our patients bring NOx into the outpatient clinic. Heparin is the most widely used and investigated drug for prophylaxis of VT. It has only a few contraindications, such as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And besides the risk of bleeding that every anticoagulant drug brings, it has few side effects, such as elevated transaminases, hyperpotassemia, and osteopenia in long-term use. Monitoring requires the control of thrombocytes, usually recommended every third day in the beginning of the therapy. And partial thromboplastin time or anti a monitoring is in prophylactic dose usually not necessary unless patient brings abnormal BRIs. Low molecular weight heparins have the advantage of a longer half-life and therefore the application once per day 
is usually sufficient for prophylaxis. Studies have shown superiority of low molecular weight heparins compared to unfractionated heparins in thromboprophylaxis. Since it is renally eliminated, uh, attention must be paid in patients with chronic kidney disease. Unfractionated heparin can be applied IV with the advantage of quicker onset of effect and easier control. It has a less predictable pharmacokinetic and dynamic though, which you have probably already experienced in patients with heparin insensitivity. It can be applied in patients with kidney failure and is better antagonizable with protamine than low molecular weight heparin. But the risk for a hit is about 10 times higher in unfractionated heparins compared to low molecular weight. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia occurs in 2% of hospitalized patients, usually on day 5 to 10 from the beginning of heparin exposition. It is a result of immune complexes with activated platelets resulting in thrombosis and the elimination of thrombocytes. There are two forms. HIT type 1 usually shows a small decrease in thrombocyte count, is clinically neglectable mostly, and heparin can also mostly be continued. HIT type 2 can be fatal and needs immediate cessation of heparin exposition and switch to an alternative anticoagulant therapy. And here's another question for our residents. Does anyone know an easy score to screen for a HIT? Um, one score would be the four T's, um, which are thrombocytopenia. Um, thrombosis, others, and also the evolution over time. Indeed. So the 4T score is an easy score everyone can use. It allows, it allows us to estimate the pretest probability of a hit. It depends on the quantitative fall of the thrombocytes, the timing of the onset, the manifestation of thrombosis, and whether there are other possible causes for the thrombocytopenia. If there is a moderate or high risk, then it makes sense to screen with antibodies. Keep in mind that there could be a hit in patients developing thrombosis despite heparin uh, prophylaxis and in patients with decreasing thrombocytes. It remains challenging and controversial when to start and for how long to continue our perioperative thromboembolic prophylaxis. Guidelines give various statements. Generally, a patient with indication for uh, thromboembolic prophylaxis and low risk of bleeding should receive prophylaxis until the end of the hospitalization or what some uh, guidelines recommend for at least seven days. Most guidelines recommend prolonged prophylaxis for uh, oncologic patients without defining oncologic patients and with inconsistent durations from two weeks to a month. A frequent dilemma is the risk of bleeding uh, during a thromboprophylaxis in surgery. Quite a number of studies show that the risk of bleeding is not significantly elevated in patients even undergoing major abdominal surgery. The individual risk of bleeding should be estimated though and depends on the type of surgery and factors such as uh, uncontrollable hypertonia, co-medication with NSARs, NSARs or uh, aspirin or thrombocytopenia. Last but not least, there is always, also in patients with high risk of bleeding, the possibility for mechanical prophylaxis. So think of it. And what I want you to take home today is that perioperative uh, venous thromboembolism is frequent, potentially uh, life-threatening and avoidable. Always think of the risk of ET and be aware of its symptoms. The prevention of ET is an individual approach and it, reads, it needs individual risk assessment where there are tools such as the Caprini score. The risk of thrombosis must always be balanced to the risk of bleeding. And they are not only pharmacological methods for VT prevention. Generally, most evidence exists for heparin, but keep in mind the possibility of a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Clearly a very important problem and probably one of the most significant breakthrough in surgery, as you have shown the very high incidence when you do nothing in these patients. This is in the concept of all these eras, now early mobilization, fluid, etc. all that is uh, very important. We have a specialist here, I'm sorry, from... Uh, Oh, the, so I think I will not talk and ask you maybe to tell us a little bit uh, or to give us uh, your um, input in this prophylaxis here. And one of the questions is that can we, we, could we replace any medication, for example, with mechanical compression in the legs? Um, actually, um, I think pharmacological uh, prophylaxis is very important. And I think as uh, Dr. Dubs showed that there are good data, even if we have uh, not such good data on how heparin works and about the pharmacological problems we do have with, uh, for example, unfractionated heparin. And so we are always uh, arguing pro uh, low molecular weight heparins to use. And I think that's a very important factor also to avoid a hit, for example. I think one thing was not mentioned, I, and there is some data in the literature that also breathing exercise regular breathing exercise with a, with a breathing machine prevents uh, venous thromboembolism because, you know, the thorax is lifting and sucking out the cava. Uh, can you say anything about this? Because this might be also important for us not only to improve pulmonary function, but also perhaps to have a positive effect on prevention of venous thromboembolism. Mm -hmm. So I included this within the part where I mentioned uh, early mobilization and physiotherapy is important. Um, there is data showing, showing a, a potential success of it. I think we must see it also as supplementations. There is not only one thing we can do and we tend to focus on the pharmacological methods. But more importantly, especially in immobilized patients, we need to mobilize every resource we can have to reduce the risk for thromboembolism. A few basic questions here. So the aspirin is not a good one for prophylaxis. Maybe you should maybe make a comment on this or, or, or order or an anticoagulant. There is no role in this. So. Uh, yes, at, at present, I, I mean, we do know that, that antiplatelet agents don't help in the venous uh, area. So they are very good for arterial uh, prophylaxis to, to, to prevent platelets from um, aggregation, but uh, it doesn't help. It's, it's a reduction about 30% only, so it's not, not very effective. And so we do need uh, heparins for the venous compartment. Uh, the direct oral anticoagulants, there will be more probably, and uh, as I know your colleagues from the Balgrist, they, they had done uh, or used it a lot, uh, but they now went back to uh, more to the low molecular weight heparins again because they had uh, several bleeding uh, complications with the DOAX in this setting. But at least you said aspirin has a 30% effect, right? Yes. Because sometimes we have problems that pa uh, patients are on aspirin and they need additional anticoagulation. So we know it's the effect is not zero. So it's, and one question is, we always say it works on the arterial side and less on the venous side. Why? Because, you know, thrombus is uh, built from thrombocytes and platelets. Uh, and if I prevent the aggregation, why is it not working on the venous side? because it doesn't interfere with the propagation phase. So you have, for example, you have uh, a real good aggregation or uh, um, inhibition, but it doesn't work on all the, the um, promotion via tissue factor endothelial damage, and you don't get an activation phase via thrombin burst. And the thrombin burst is something very important to get a clot. And that's something you can't avoid with, uh, uh, with aspirin. Uh, we have heard that there are different recommendations for cancer patients. What would you say would be adequate for those patients? Um, do you mean in the in the prevention phase or in the post the post-operative? Uh, I mean, you have a high bleeding risk as well, so you always have to judge and to think uh, when to start it. But uh, probably as early as you can, you should start it because you have a much higher thrombosis risk.
and we have good data for um, uh, therapy in, in uh, cancer patients. So normally we, we use uh, nowadays uh, direct oral anticoagulants. Postoperative, I think the minimum is when you have them at, if everything you mean, the, the, the tumor is cleared completely or the tumor, f f tumor free. Okay, then probably it's, it's uh, the complete immobilization. So the minimum is, is as he told us, uh, seven to 10 days. And uh, if you get uh, longer immobilization, you should prolong it, of course. And if you have ongoing cancer, uh, we normally go to a therapeutic dose of the uh, anticoagulant and, and diminish it after about uh, six to eight weeks. Okay, thank you very much.